morning, everyone. This is The Cut. Uh, we've had a great um, amount of interest in our episodes on the uh, insolvency and restructuring personalities. Today, we have an interview with uh, Bronwyn DeMont and Gary Busby of the Australian Taxation Office. Very important people in our industry. Uh, they play a very crucial role through the insolvency and restructurings that exist uh, in the market. Both of them head up the lodge and pay management team and uh, today we're going to talk to them about what they're seeing in the market, get to know who they are and where they might see the market going forward. Now we've recorded this the other day at Sky Suites at Parramatta and there are some sound issues so we've just re-recorded the opening segment but the topic and the the questions and are very interesting and you know, please listen and please bear with us through the program caused by the sounding issues and the equipment that we use. But enjoy the episode and uh, look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning son. Thanks for joining us. It's, uh, it's, you know, these episodes are always good and we get a lot of interesting topics around insolvency and restructuring. But I thought it'd be useful for, for the people that watch this um, to, 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 to hear more about the two of you and where you came from and maybe Bronwyn we might start with you just sort of a bit of background as to where and how you started in the group. Sure. Um, really not that exciting. So I did, um, my first job was a bookkeeper for a small business many, many years ago and I'm not going to say how long ago because you would all then know my age, which I like to keep close to myself, right? Um, so I then started with the ATO and I've worked in the ATO for many, many years. Um, but the ATO is a really large organisation, so I've done lots of different roles. However, for about 10 years, past 10 years, I've been focused on debt collection, uh, both legal recovery, stronger actions, stronger type actions like director penalties, that sort of work, and insolvency. And how big is the team? Uh, so we have a really large team um, in Parramatta, uh, around 200 staff with lots of different work types. So we have um, some insolvency, more operationally focused teams, yeah. requests for documents from insolvency practitioners, preference claims, creditors meetings. Yeah. Um, we also do some work on insolvency procedures for the rest of the lodge and pay area, basically. So we have some wind-up teams, we have some bankruptcy teams or creditors' petition and bankruptcy teams. We have a, a, quite a few teams that do summonses. Yeah. Um, and we also man inbound phones for stronger and legal action work types. And we have some um, other work types where, you know, particular skill sets are required, such as large withholders, mm-hmm. um, we might come back to that because we'll just get on to Gary. And Gary, you, you have a bit of a different background. I think you were in the world of insolvency practitioners there at some stage, but it gives a bit of a back and a bit of a history in where you come from. Uh, yes, happy to, Simon. So, um, uh, well, I started in the insolvency industry over 40 years ago now, so wow. in the UK. Uh, so I started with a, uh, a small boutique firm uh, in the west end of London and uh, – uh, after a few years there, I moved to what was then a, a big eight firm, um, stayed there for a few years and then moved to a, um, a mid-size general practice where I stayed up until 2001 when I migrated to Australia. Um, so I came to Sydney and I joined one of the big four firms in Sydney and was there for a Uh, a couple of years and then the uh, restructuring insolvency arm separated off to to form an independent boutique firm and I remained there as a director up until uh, 2015. Um, And after that, I I set out on my own doing some consulting business, um, doing um, a lot of work for um, the um, uh, one of the industry associations, helping them develop their training courses and uh, assisting with the the postgraduate uh, qualifications that they offered as well. So I did that up until 2017 when I was recruited by the ATO as um, an in-house insolvency expert. Yeah. And um, 
Um, I work uh, closely with Bronwyn and her teams. Um, uh, and currently I head up what's known as the, the complex insolvency team. Uh, so that's a team that deals with the um, um, uh, arrangements and restructuring type proposals through diesel company arrangements, small business restructuring. Um, we also um, uh, participate on committees of inspection on our high risk and, and uh, high profile matters. Uh, we also deal with the um, uh, indemnity funding that we provide to liquidators and, and bankruptcy trustees. Uh, we also are um, uh, involved in dealing with the, the tax and, and super legislation where it intersects with insolvency. So we, we get a lot of those technical queries come our way. And we work closely with the um, the industry bodies and the regulators as well. So it's a, a, a little bit more niche than, um, yeah. than than a lot of Bronwyn's teams. We're a smaller team, but yeah. but we do work closely together. But they put, you put the two of you together, and the responsibility is massive. Uh, look, I, I suppose it is um, yeah. definitely lots of work for us, right, Gary? Um, and I think we um, working closely together. We. You know, we're able to identify risks or issues and rely on Gary's team to, to work with us on them, which yeah. works really well. You know, I've been in the industry for 25 years and I've certainly seen significant improvement around the legislation, around the processes in the last 10 years. Um, the COVID worries me a little bit, but in some sense, uh, all that great effort of getting taxpayers doing what they're supposed to be doing. Look, we've always been, uh, uh, you know, uh, an informed and engaged creditor, and, and we do see part of our role to to try and lead, uh, you know, the analysis and and uh, and the questioning at some of the meetings. And uh, yes, we we do, you know, we have made a point of trying to to expand the, the range of questions, and we also have made a point of um, of trying to engage with practitioners ahead of meetings where we do have concerns um, so that you know the, the meeting can be much more productive that way so yeah that's definitely been been a, a, an emphasis that we've looked at over the last few years yeah. and uh, you know we, we intend to, to continue with that um, I mean as, as volumes increase it will probably stretch us a little more but um, we're, we're, we intend to keep doing that yeah, you and I have had a number of conversations ahead of the meeting on like previous matters, and, and for me, I, I like that. I, I like to hear what's coming. I think some of the, some of the other players in the market get nervous, and I sort of say to them, I say, "Why? Like this is this is good." You know, the, the, the tax office and other government departments, like Beg and into the lesser extent, that's it. We'll, we'll make calls of, um, ahead of the meeting previews, um, but you know, I really welcome that. And I think that that stuff should continue. Um, what I do find in meetings, certainly in the last couple of years, is it, that, that sort of silence that seems to sit there in these meetings starts to open up a bit more because you know, there's four or five questions that your team member will ask. Um, a couple of them will be focused purely on lodgements. Yeah, I get that. But then they start talking about the business itself. Um, and I think that's a, a very helpful um, thing for, 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 for the other creditors because they're just not experienced, particularly the employees where you know, they, they just don't know and understand the process. But in terms of the, the team, um, um, you know, what, what's, what are the kind of things that you would like to see during, uh, say, say, an insolvency matter that would help out, um, uh, help out in trying to get a, a better, better perspective on what, what the position is with, 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 that, with the company in insolvency. Is there any particular things that you sort of look for? Well, in in the area that my team focuses on, which is voluntary arrangements and diesel company uh, arrangements, um, and um, more recently small business restructuring, it's really um, you know if we're a significant creditor and there may be you know some controversial terms being offered under a, a docker or, or even under a restructuring plan. Um, you know, as I say, we, we want to get that early engagement. And, and pleasingly, we, we're actually getting a much broader engagement now with the industry. Yeah. Um, so so that, that we, we see that as, it, as some success is, is starting to work. 
Um, you know, things that we look for are, you know, differential treatment of creditors under deeds of company arrangements, the use of creditors' trusts, and we, we like to get behind that and actually understand the reasoning. And, uh, you, you know, and, and we're open to considering these things. We don't have any set rules on how we're going to deal with them. It's, uh, you know, every case on its merits, but we just need to understand a bit more about it. And sometimes it's it's not obvious from, from the terms that might be circulated in a report or, or sometimes, you know, people will engage early and actually send a draft report and say, look, do you have any concerns? And, and that actually helps us try and iron out those wrinkles before it actually gets, you yeah. know, gets to the finalised uh, position um, with small business restructuring, I think because th- there's there's no opportunity to, to negotiate the terms once the plan's signed off. So you know we we have made a point of of, of saying we are open to talk. You know if we're a major creditor, um, and you know it, 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 you know maybe maybe the terms of the plan may not be overly attractive, but there may be good reasons for that. Then just talk to us beforehand, yeah. because we okay. you know because we only have a, a you know a vote yes or no. We don't we can't yeah. go back and say well, you know if we'd had a bit you know if, if, is there scope to change a few things. In a way, it sounds like what the banks are asking for. The banks will say to us, "Look, you know, give us a call ahead of the appointment." We're saying, "Give us a call ahead of the actual plan being released, just to see if there's anything we can add and give you some perspective as to whether." Yeah, you're, you're supportive Yeah, well, particularly if, if we're a major creditor where our vote's going to make a difference to the outcome, then yeah. then, then I'd say so, yes. Well, I imagine under those small business restructuring plans, you know, primarily the creditors are the tax office. And that's, you know, the, the, the limit is too small, in my view. I think one million is just not practical. It's, um, it's attracting a very significant kind of business, and most of those businesses are black and white. And generally, they either close down or will pay the debt. So I, I think if they raise that up to sort of five or even ten million dollars, you would see a lot more engagement in those kind of processes. But it is definitely picking up in my seat. Um, is there any um so just 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 moving away from the insolvency industry a little bit just talking about the other parts of your 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 team role and what they focus on. Is there any sort of things that you're starting to see that uh, on those businesses that are not in liquidation but are in the years, they're, they're, in, they're in that collective debt space. Is there any sort of, um, uh, yeah, well, what I'm saying to my, my accounts and the words is, you know, you've got to be proactive. The tax pool is there for reasons to give you visibility in what the position is. Is there any sort of, sort of areas there that maybe the accountant should be focusing on with their, with their, uh, with their clients? Um, but there's probably a few. Um, so I, I think we started at, recommencing firmer and stronger actions in August. Um, you know, we did have some periods during that sort of COVID two-year lockdown, you know, rolling lockdowns. We did um, start to re-engage, contact our clients, but from solidly about August, we've started to contact our clients. Our first preference is always to resolve it, having a conversation, getting people back on track, Um you know, rather than having to take stronger or legal action. I mean, we don't really like to have to resort to that. Um, I think what we're finding challenging is actually contacting and having a conversation with clients. So, I mean, everybody's busy. Um, So we do try and attempt that multiple times before we take action. So importantly, you know, come to the ATO. D- don't wait for the call. If we're calling you, we do. We're at the point where we need to have a conversation because there's not been arrangements made. And if we're not able to contact, we really don't have any other option but to start a collection process, which might be a direct to penalty, might be a garnishee. You know, could be a, a statutory demand for payment. You know, there's a range of options that we will consider at that point. And really, that sounds to me that the account should be getting the front foot calling the clients and say, can you pay this or not? And if you can't pay it, you need to move into the insolvency yeah. options and the restructuring options. Um, but if you can pay it, let's, let's make contact with the ATO yeah. and, 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 and do that. So, um, yeah, certainly the, 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 the good accountants are already do that. They're, they're proactive and, yeah, obviously they don't have as much insolvency work from anybody else. Um, the um, direct appellate notice seems to be a fair bit 
the market at the moment, like uh, to be talking amongst the insolvency practitioners and in, in uh, industry events and or, or similar events that they were all together. Um, most of the, the commentary I'm hearing is that I'm getting a lot of work and I, I can be up to that because of my last, I think, three jobs with DB and Driven. Um, that seems to have been a, 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 the, the, the current method at the moment. You go back pre-COVID, you, know, you would regularly see one out and is, is that is that a deliberate thing or is that something that's is just naturally occurs? So I think... Um it's probably about where we're at in our collection process because we paused all of our actions, all of our legal actions for you know a two-year period. We're starting that up. Um, we would always look to issue a director penalty notice where there is withholding tax, superannuation guarantee, and of late GST. Um, you know, given that they are debts that are. If- I suppose effectively held on trust yeah. by the company um, and would be remitted to the ATO. So particularly super, you know, that's a really big impact for all of those employees whose superannuation hasn't been paid. So we do look to focus there in the first instance. Um, we have, um, I think we sent out, I think it was 50,000 letters, yeah. you know, to director, directors of, of companies that we yeah. were looking to, to do that action to allow people that time to really come to us, engage, get back on track, make an arrangement, and then we've then now started to look at issuing direct penalty notices where appropriate, but we're also issuing statutory demands um, and summonses at the moment. So we are not um, advanced enough in that yeah. process to be winding up. Um, but we have started to issue statutory demands. Now, as an industry, we've had conversations at, at conferences where we've actually said, why should the tax office be bearing the cost of dealing with someone's inability to pay the debt? And is there a, a mechanism to bring in laws where you know, someone in the audience, um, when I was presenting with um, you know, um, John Winter and Mark Willard at the, one of the reader days, and... Um, Someone said, why don't you have a automatic $5,000 or $10,000 fee that gets imposed on the group that on the point of person? So in other words, they they cut the cost. So if you if you go down and wind the company up and incur petition creditors' costs, that should be recovered against the director's person. So I, I don't know if there's any view on that, but it, that's some of the ideas that we've seen in the industry saying you know, the, the burden of the cost here should be borne more by the person that's failed to pay um, because it, um, that put the deeply in certainly what I've seen where, and whether it's just coincidence, the frequency of jobs coming in from my firm have been you know, um, deeply driven um, um, actions. You know. Is there any sort of comment on those thoughts there, just on the on sort of you know, imposing sort of something? Like Gary, maybe I'll ask you just if you had any thoughts on that. Although the ATO is a, a creditor in, yeah. in, in many, many um, insolvencies, we're not often the, the actual instigator of, of the insolvency process itself. Yeah. We, do, we do issue some wind-ups, we do issue some bankruptcy notices, but uh, as you know, most insolvencies are, are sort of um, uh, you know, owner-driven through you know, voluntary liquidation or, or voluntary administration. Um, and of course, the private sector as well. They're they're, they're often um, you know petitioning creditors in, in wind ups and, and bankruptcies. You see um, a lot of the current insolvencies using the exclusive COVID course the failure of this company. Is this certainly a common reason for the failure of the company? Yeah. Look, it's it's often raised, and yeah. and uh, you know, and understandably so. You know, depend, particularly depending on the. The sector that the business operates yeah, in, right. and uh, and and you, you can see from, you know, the profile of their you know their financials that that, that sales have definitely dropped off. So you know we, we do understand they have been impacted, and and you know in in many cases it is um, you know a genuine reason. There may be other reasons, of course, as well. But uh, yeah, we do see that. Yeah, I'm a bit balanced on the view as to whether it's just a convenient excuse. And um, yeah, if you go back, in my view. 90% of the insolvency is caused by poor management. People are not doing the fundamentals, doing proper bookkeeping, getting proper accounting services, 
making sure that they're managing the cash flow. Um, right? We spend an enormous amount of time in our industry teaching and coaching our referrals to, to about cash flow, about managing the cash, managing the working capital. You know, I don't think COVID's changed that in the sense that there's people out there that, that just are not doing the proper fundamentals of what, what it takes to run a business. Um, and uh, you know, in, this, in, this, in this area of low employment, uh, and seemingly we've, we've had low interest rate environment, it's become more attractive to set up your own business, but there hasn't been any sort of logical thinking as to well, is it a sustainable business because economic conditions change. Um, I just want to sort of swing back a little bit on the employment front because what, what I think I've seen over the industry, uh, in, in our industry, in, in insolvencies, and in, certainly in recent years, as a result of your efforts and, and, and fees, there's a real focus of looking after the employees. There's a real, I suppose, I wouldn't call it a requirement, but a real sort of want to make sure that in any restructures, the employees are getting looked after. Um, is that sort of your view on that? Is there any thoughts on, 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 that, on, that, on that position? Uh, look, I suppose generally um, we would, you know, have a strong focus on collecting superannuation. Um, you know, there, there can be um, many people, you know, if you, we think about a large employer, many people impacted by the non-payment of super, and that has a really future impact, right? So, you, you know, it's not something that's necessarily immediate, but, you know, there is a, a, a future issue um, with not paying it. So, um, look, I think we would like all taxes to be paid on time, um, but that's not going to happen. Um, you know, but, you know, superannuation, importantly, we need to make sure that we are ensuring superannuation on behalf of employees is paid because of the significant impact that's going to cause those employees in the longer term, I suppose. Um, well, it's, it's money invested. So if I, if you're my employee, Gary, if I want to pay you for two years late, you've lost two years of investment return. Um, because that money goes into funds. Um, you know, I totally agree with it. Like, uh, in, in, in conversations leading up to the point, I'm very, I say to my, my clients, you know, can you pay the super? Let's get sorted. What can you pay to, to deal with the employee fund? Can you pay the entitlements? Can you pay the super? The priority creditors, and they don't get captured by the, the, the global transactions that they, they, they need to be looked up. Um, and I, I think personally, the drive that um, through a combination of yourselves and key have really brought it to a, to a focus, which I think sits in the right spot. Um, so, in terms of what we see, what, what you, you might think we'll see over the next twelve months, um, any sort of any sort of ideas or thoughts there? Um, market conditions, taxpayers generally. Is there any sort of views that? You have on that? I'd take that one first. So, <laughs> look, I, I think we, we're starting to see increasing numbers of, of insolvency. We expect that to continue. Um, I, I, I think there is, um, there is a backlog of insolvency that, that is in the, in the system, and, and, and that will probably work its way through over the next you know, six to 12 months. Um, once that's worked through, what what the numbers will look like, the the new normal numbers after that, it's a bit harder to to see. Um, but uh, I think now that we're um, uh, refocused on our our firmer and stronger action, I, th I think it'll be a, a steady flow. But then again, I think you'll get to a stage where, so you, you'll hit that new normal, and um, um, you know the numbers will will stabilise. I'm sure. Yeah. It's hard to know whether it's a whether we're just catching up or correcting. I still feel like we're in the catch up phase. Is that sort of your view of the moment? Is it really catch up? I think it's really hard to say. I think, you know, we've heard lots of predictions over the last couple yeah. of years and Gary and I are often asked this, but but I I think we're in new territory. I, I don't think we could necessarily compare what we're seeing now to what we've seen, you know, post GFC, for instance. Um, I think we've got a lot of challenges, you know, um, you know, for small businesses, you know, for any business, and um, you know, I just, I think we just have to wait and see. We've not seen 
the tsunami of insolvencies that was predicted? Um, no, that's right. But is that starting now? Richard? Yeah, and I think fair to say I, I, I got my predictions wrong about six times during COVID because you just the, the, everyone the green up and beautiful views and everything just keep as we can see now that it'll shut down and lock down globally at a significant adverse effect on the insolvency industry. And things were dropping seventy percent, wine ups were down ninety percent. Um, but it doesn't mean that those businesses have gone away. They're still there. Um, yeah, some of the we're seeing small trends, and maybe it's just a short term thing on certain states having more insolvency than others. Are you seeing any patterns there at the moment? Is, it, is that just is that just industry gossip? Look, I don't think we've particularly noticed any any trend, you know, state based or. or otherwise really um yeah. uh, i think one observation and it, it it comes from a very low base so it's probably not that that informative but on the small business restructuring um that uh, nearly all the appointments during the first you know the first year of it were all seen to be east east and seaboard yeah not much anywhere else and um you know that that might even out yeah is it picked up in the SPR as you've seen like, is it still like it was um, remarkably low? Like, yeah, it, it it certainly has picked up. Um, June was was a very busy month. I think there was I mean low numbers again, but I think there was like twenty three appointments yeah. dropped off in in July, maybe to eleven or so. Yeah. This month in August, I I think we've already had more than twenty five. So it's it's probably going to be a busy month, and it's hard to know that yeah. whether that that is going to be the nor the normal yeah. or whether it's just going to fluctuate Did you again. Know what the um, I did have a look. Uh, it, interestingly, the, the first full year of, of COVID, so if we take the, the 22 year, VA appointments were, were down by um, uh, almost a half, yeah. but the number of dockers was actually up. Is actually up and above the the number for pre-COVID levels. Now, I think that's probably distorted a bit with some large groups in there. But uh, it was just an inter- at a very high level. It was quite interesting. Then um, I think the following year it it it, it dipped down a bit. Uh, four hours, yeah, yeah. So sorry, man. The twenty one year it was very high. The twenty two year it was it was a bit lower. A bit lower, was it? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think you know we are seeing a really different environment, and I think even in terms of what the ATO. Um, is doing so we can now disclose business tax debts Um, we are really focused on that direct to penalty area you know so I think we I just think it's very hard to make any prediction and to understand what we might see over the next 12 months Um, you know really interesting I don't know if there's I think the media are trying their best to set some trend but there isn't there's a lot of media obviously in the construction space and Really, is it the other the industries? And I brought back the appointments and the high, the more more well known appointments, and there's no consistency there. There's no trend. You know, I have heard that um, construction appointments are up in, in comparison to historical levels, and I, and I have no doubt that the profitability in that industry is well down because the cost of steel and the cost of timber is, 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 is much much higher. And I would argue that it's probably not that probably similar to other industries like hospitality. And you know, we'll we start to see retail trend and um, in, in struggle as interest rates go up. Um, whether interest rates actually fixes the inflation problem, I'm not sure either. I think productivity is um, uh, is a big cause of or, or, or low productivity is a big cause of inflation. Um, director identification numbers. I just want to talk a bit about that now. Um, so that's sort of had, is now up and running. Um, is that having any impact on your work? Is it helping? Is it, does it have any? I think it's a great mission. I think personally we've seen in our industry many uh, alternative uh, personalities be the same person. I ran a case which was funded by ASIC and ATO and you might have had six different names. Um, all with the same sort of, you know, 
people call me Simon and Simon and Simon or whatever you want to say. Like you, you, I saw sort of different iterations of the same person using it. Do um, you think that that's going to help? What, what's your thoughts on the Oh, I think over time it will. Um, so I think, um, you know, when we start to collect against the directors, directors into the future, I think we will see less issue with being able to identify directors. So um, that's, I think, a longer term proposition, though, because, you know, it was a point in time start. So we'll need to see, you know, that data over time be you know, more correct than what it's been in the past. Yeah. Now, now just on um, terms of, um, let's start, start, let's try and talk a little bit about some of the worst behaving tax rates. Um, I suppose you've seen a, a number of uh, schemes with one accord or structures that have been put in place and, and the ATO have done very well. And I've seen a couple of, the correspondence on the analysis and the systems where, where the tax office systems have really come up with some very sophisticated um, letters or some types where they're outlining what they believe is going on in a, in a particular business. Um, you know, where, the, where the benchmarking falls into that or, or something like that. You know, that, that to me suggests, uh, suggests that the, you know, the tax office is getting much better at identifying these schemes or these, these, these efforts to try and evade tax, not avoid tax, but evade tax. Is, is that, are you seeing any, any patterns there? Is there something you get visibility on? Uh, this is a hard one, I suppose, for Gary and I because it's, you know, we deal with debt that's established or yeah. trying to establish debt. Yeah. Um, we do have um, in our branch, uh, you know, teams that, case manage and deal with egregious behaviour, um, you know, high risk issues. So I really actually don't think I could offer anything. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think generally I would say, um, and not just in the ATO, we now have data that we've never had, you know, we, that we didn't have five years ago, let alone, you know, 10 years ago. So I think that will... Um, and you just identify that. many of these issues, right? You share that too, don't you? You share that with 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 with, with, the, with, with the taxpayers some of that information, and that gives a bit more visibility around yeah. what, what, what the trends are. Yeah, I, I mean, you know. Most people willingly comply. You know, most small businesses willing comply, willingly comply. So we're only talking about a really small percentage, um, and, and I think, you know, that data helps identify those issues or patterns um, and it's much easier easier to address if you can identify yeah. it. So you don't need to answer this one, but do you think cash will be better than that? I mean, obviously, from a tax office, it's, you know, everything can be trying to be better because it tracks and captures things. Well, I think the impact of COVID probably did speed that up a lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, but but I think it'll always be a, a factor. Yeah, it will always be there, but I think the cash is uh, what we call it, the cash economy is a lot smaller than what it has been in, in over the years. Look, I, I think we're almost wrapped up. We um, we've been going now for a good period of time, but uh, I think just to, to finish, is there any sort of Final thoughts that you had, just in terms of a for the accountants, for for the insolvency industry, any, any sort of things that you really want to get out there. I mean, you talk, Gary, about openness and, and getting on the front foot. I think that's a really good piece that we should take on board and to, to get on the front and have those upfront conversations in prior to a board. Is there any sort of things that you want to follow? If you want to give us a call, um, is my really strong message. Engage with us. Um, where clients don't engage with us or their tax agents don't engage with us, you know, we, we will take an option based on the information we have um, and, you know, we would rather see businesses exit with dignity rather than have to take those actions. Um, but we would really like to work with small businesses and businesses generally to get them back on track. Yeah. And, and, and do you think there will be... Um Greater efforts in restoring the behaviour. Like, I mean, the, the behaviour, when I say behaviour, I mean, obviously, 
things went, 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 went slow in the COVID period, but we've probably lost a bit of good behaviour that had been built up over the years. Yeah, look, I, I don't think people have started to behave badly. Yeah. I think, um, you know, as, you know, indicated earlier in the discussion, we are seeing some COVID impacts um, in our debtors. We, we definitely can see that they have been impacted, you know, and in many different ways too. It, it may have been about rolling lockdowns. It may have been other issues. Um, so I think um, most people do comply and will comply. They may have a debt situation that they haven't had and the best way to deal with that is to give us a call, yeah. make an arrangement to pay, you know. I can vouch for you. I, I talk to you all the time and my team is yeah, extremely reasonable and uh, we, we have differences of opinions that we talk about and I think, I think if, if particularly those accounts and their clients understand that, that they should be reaching out and not being so yeah. afraid. Gary, did you have anything to say to you? Well, I just echo what Bronwyn said and, and what I mentioned earlier. Look, uh, you know, early engagement is always the best way. Uh, you know, there may be more options than you realise. Um, you know, payment plans are, are always there, and where, where it, you know, it, maybe it's it's beyond that, and and you're looking at some sort of restructuring again. Um, early engagement. I mean, we'd rather see a, a business, you know, survive than, than close down. Well, thank you, Bronwyn and Gary. Um, very interesting interview. Um, had a lot of very valuable information and insights into the way the Australian Taxation Office operates in this space. Um, I think it's, there's no doubt the next 12 months is going to be a very interesting period for the economy and um, certainly for the insolvency industry. Um, Gary, with all your experience in the UK and Australia and all the work that both you and Bronwyn have done to improve and to you know take it almost to the next level with respect with respect to the insolvency process and interacting with the, the practitioners and we go thank you for that it's you done an excellent job um, and I think I think the final piece to, to finish off is 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 a, is a comment that Bronwyn made earlier on around you know for, for, for people that have got outstanding tax, the best advice is to reach out to the tax office and engage with them. It's important that they, that you, you, you don't avoid that and, and be afraid of not making that contact. So do reach out to, to the tax office, do have a conversation with someone from Bronwyn and Gary's teams. And the main and the most important thing is, is that, you know, don't let it get to the stage where the stronger action initiatives project kicks in and um, you know the tax office is forced to take steps around recovery um, being on the fr front foot and discussing with them around payment plans and next steps is always a much better approach rather than just completely ignoring the obligations that exist around tax but thanks again and look forward to everyone watching the next episode um, and thank you again to Bronwyn and Gary for joining us